There was a point in time where the fourth largest army in the world had a tank force deemed to be one of the most deadly and unstoppable. This army would fill many iconic Soviet designs, long praised for their impressive firepower and durability. After gaining much experience in the Iran-Iraq war, Saddam's battle-hardened forces stood ready to meet any foe that would dare cross them. That was until, on the 26th of February 1991, something would appear in the horizon. A new iron beast, ready to cement its name in the history of armoured warfare. The mighty M1 Abrams. Following the T-62's introduction, it became clear to the US Department of Defense that if they didn't come up with a replacement to the M60, they may end up outclassed in an armored standoff with the growing Iron Horde, possessed by the USSR. While some of these Soviet designs have aged for quite some time and have a poorer reputation today, they were a genuine threat taken very seriously by the West. It was very clear that the Soviets would not be standing still and were no doubt working on more classified armoured projects. In an attempt to remedy this, the US and West Germany would team up on a project to create a new tank. Unable to match the Soviets in quantity, they aimed for quality. This would result in the MBT-70 project, a promising but vastly over budget behemoth. It was however an undeniably valuable learning experience that would go on to influence the Abrams and Leopard programs in many ways. Known for its peculiar system of having the driver in the turret and many other quirks, it was ultimately cancelled due to a number of issues. Not long after, the XM1 would come into fruition, a new project based off the lessons learned from its failed predecessor where the DNA for the Abrams finally began to form. It would be Chrysler Defense and General Motors that competed in providing the next MBT for the United States. Both saw promising designs with a number of early issues, but it would ultimately be the gas turbine Chrysler design that struck home, and was then put into its final form, the M1 Abrams. The model you see today is quite different from the early production M1s, yet still shares the same iconic design that I'm sure many of you can agree has aged like fine wine. I mean seriously, can you believe this design is over 40 years old? Nevertheless, the early Abrams featured the rifled M68A1 105mm gun based on the well-known British L7, but with many differences that made it pretty unique. This gun was fitted to thousands of M1 models, and despite it being based on the same platform the Centurion used, it kept up well with a number of shells having penetration values of over 500mm, which was pretty good for the late 70s and early 80s. With the onset of the M1A1 variant being introduced however, so too were many key changes. Most notably here being the upgrade to the M2 5620 120mm smoothbore, which, like the M68, was a borrowed design with a number of changes this time from the German L44 that is perhaps most known for being in the Leopard 2. The most advanced rounds available to this gun are quite impressive. The declassified M82-9A3 APF-SDS can handle 800mm of rolled homogenous armour. However, any US fielded Abrams would likely field the latest M82-9A4 5th generation APF-SDS-T which is rumoured to be well capable of punching through a metre of armour. Unlike the A3, was designed with the purpose of mitigating explosive reactive armour. Therefore, on the subject of lethality, the Abrams scores very, very highly. This new M1A1 variant also saw an update to its blowout panels, an aspect that makes the Abrams one of the best tanks to be in if your ammunition is to be ignited. As we all know by now, the ammunition is safely stored in the rear bustle of the turret, which is separated from the crew compartment by a thick blast door that remains closed and less in use. The next big upgrade would be to the M1A2, where many changes to the vehicle's situational awareness were made to increase lethality even more. 
the commander received an independent thermal sight, which might not seem like as big a change as an entirely new gun, but it's important not to underestimate how truly important situational awareness is in armoured warfare. In all, there have been a number of upgrades to keep the Abrams a relevant contender in battle, too many in fact to list, with the latest in use being the M1A2 SEP V3. Of course, we can't discuss the tank and not discuss its armour. As always, discussing said armour requires the acceptance that up-to-date information is largely classified, or based on speculation. But from what we do know, the armour in the turret cheeks is easily over a metre thick, but the actual values provided with the composite and depleted uranium application are just not clear, and it also varies by which model is being discussed. From real-world footage of both standard and export variants against a variety of different projectiles, the Abrams is nothing to snort at in terms of its protection and may still remain one of the top titans of protection. This is, however, with the caveat that, no, it's not indestructible just like any other tank. Tanks can be made in the country you like or the country you don't like, but armour is not that simple. It's not a case of being either rubbish or indestructible, you can go ahead and google pictures of destroyed Abrams and no doubt this will happen should they be fielded in Ukraine because as good as your armour is, your side armour can only be so thick due to weight distribution and current technological limitations. In the end, it all comes down to the earth itself beneath any armoured vehicle that is a huge deciding factor in how much weight can be fielded. Armour is heavy and if you want a lot of armour, you're going to have a lot of weight. That weight is a valid point of contention with the Abrams coming in at around 70 tonnes. In the current climate, this is mostly relevant to its usage in Europe, particularly Ukraine. Yes, it's a valid concern that many bridges may prove a challenge for these heavy behemoths to traverse. However, that can be remedied by the wizards of any military, which is of course, the engineers. Well, while it's not an absolute barrier for the use of the Abrams in Ukraine, it will indeed pose a greater logistical strain than the Leopards and Soviet-era tanks that are currently fielded. This is why the MBT-70 mentioned previously had some issues, as the German military was only really concerned about how a tank will perform in Europe, unlike the US that was looking at a much more universally capable tank across the world. So, the weight of the Abrams, is it a pro, or a con? Well, that's where nuance comes in. Are you in the flat plains with dry weather and few rivers, then your armour is worth the extra weight. But somewhere like Europe, that armour could be traded for putting a lessened strain on logistics. So really, it's neither. Like many things, it's a design choice that can either work for or against the armies using them. The Abrams does have one thing that's kept it at the top for quite some time, however, and that is the previously mentioned situational awareness. In the Battle of 73 Easting, the advanced optics and fire control of the Abrams proved crucial, with many Soviet-made tanks not receiving full solution digital fire control until the early 2000s under the banner of the Russian Federation. The Abrams is inevitably a result of the Western doctrine at the time of its creation. Expecting hordes of Soviet tanks to attack in brute force, the concepts of dug-in tanks that were designed to pull their weight not in numbers, but quality. The Abrams isn't indestructible. If you hit that lower glasses, you will get through. But if you have an Abrams dug in a hull down position, or using the high ground and only revealing its turret, you can see how the armour and firepower were well worth the added weight. That's going to be a very tough tank to defeat, even today. Fortunately, the Cold War never turned into a direct conflict, and these waves never came. The USSR ended almost overnight and the Abrams never needed to do what it was ultimately designed for. Despite this, it would really make history in the Gulf War. Only a single Abrams required being towed after receiving damage from enemy tank fire after three direct hits, with six others taking multiple hits with negligible damage from the same 125mm gun still in use with the Russian T-90 today. Of course, with different shells that is. So when it comes to the mighty Abrams, its reputation is well earned. It helps that Iraqi T-72s were outdated, 
but even the latest Soviet T-72s in service before the collapse never fielded full solution digital fire control or enough armour to protect it from the 120mm gun on the Abrams. It truly was ahead of its time. In a purely performance perspective, it's undeniable. The iconic M1 Abrams is one of the best tanks in the world. But what about the future? Does the Abrams still have what it takes to maintain its dominance on the battlefield? Well, the Abrams X is an attempted answer to this question, featuring perhaps the best optics, gun, and interestingly enough, an uncrewed turret, it truly requires an entire video of its own. So make sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss that in the future. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.